Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this uh, uh, side event session, uh, which is entitled Myths, Realities and Solutions Towards High Integrity Forest Carbon Credits. My name is uh, Sven Wunder. I'm a principal scientist with the European Forest Institute, and uh, also uh, I am a senior associate of, uh, of CIFO, of the Center for International Forestry Research. Um, and um, let's start with some housekeeping, which has now disappeared from my screen. Uh, sorry. Um, so maybe I can say first uh, that uh, uh, there will be interaction with the public in this, in this session. Uh, <clears throat> on the one hand, there's a chat box uh, with uh, uh, is reserved for technical issues, and there's a question and answer box uh, which will allow for, for questions to be posed to the panelists. Um, uh, then uh, 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 there is a, a, a communication regarding the recording of this session, and I quote, we wish to inform you that the event will be recorded to facilitate note taking after the meeting. Data will be destroyed once this process, uh, once this purpose is served. Please let us know if you have any questions or concerns. It's gone. Okay. Um, good. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> as to our our panel, I will briefly introduce Kevin Brown from uh, uh, WCS. Uh, uh, we have a uh, online uh, also Adit Angelsen uh, and uh, Aaron Sills, and uh, we have uh, Tui from uh, uh, C4 Ecraft uh, also as a as a commentator. We are trying to uh, it's an exciting issue. So we're trying to to span perspectives going from the academic to the uh, more applied and uh, practitioners perspective. Um, uh, we've seen a, a remarkable growth of the carbon market uh, over the recent years, uh, uh, and that is uh, in principle a good thing, but we've also seen uh, quite a lot of critique, as with the Guardian article in, in, uh, in, in January, uh, uh, and a recent, uh, recent uh, editorial from the Guardian uh, starts off by saying, the emerging carbon offsets markets is chaotic and dysfunctional, uh, full stop. Um, so uh, there's a lot uh, to discuss. I hope we're going to have some interesting viewpoints from our panelists and from, from, uh, from you here in the audience and people, people uh, online. Um, and with that, uh, uh, let me start with uh, uh, Adelt Angelsen. Uh, Adelt, could you? Uh, share your screen and start your presentation. Arlet Angersen is from the uh, Agriculture University in, uh, in Norway, uh, has been working on deforestation issues for, uh, for many years. Yeah, uh, I, you have to stop sharing before I can s share. Okay, so good morning or no, afternoon. Well, it depends on where you are. So you see my screen okay now? Yes, it's not full and screen yet. Here we go, that full screen. So. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for the invitation. Sorry for not being in Rome, but I saved a few carbon emissions, although the plane would probably have flown anyway. Um, I'm, I'm going to give a brief introduction to, to the title is Red Creds and Carbon Market. And, uh, and just some of the basic issues that hopefully can provide some framework for the discussions and uh, presentations also that we are going to have this afternoon. So, originally when RED was conceived, COP15, uh, maybe I'm mixing two dates here on the screen, COP15, that was 2009, but also 
two years before, in 2007. The main idea was to quote the Bali uh, Declaration on Red was policy approaches and positive incentives. So positive incentive is UNFCCC speak for result-based payment, payment for environmental slash ecosystem services, cash on delivery, whatever you want to call the baby. The, the, the core idea was you pay based on verified or certified emission reductions. That's the basic idea. The implementation has been slow. And up to now, I would say RED has mainly not been about paying for results. It has been more phase one on phase two of, of RED, which is phase one being kind of the preparatory laying the ground, building up the, the MRV system, phase two being more the first part, policy implementation, and then a third phase as payment of results. But we are increasingly doing so. So when I teach a bit on red to students, I start very basic and I thought I should do the same. What does it take to create a market? In this case, a carbon market. And note that I use marketing in a kind of a broad sense because it is include any type of result-based funding, we're paying someone for delivering a particular kind of service emission reductions in our case, whether the money comes from, from private investors in a carbon market or from public funds. So here are the four elements that you need. First, you need a commodity or a service, a, an emission reduction, which is not a very tangible thing. So you need a couple of things. You need an MRV system for measuring, report, and verify that the, the, the change in, say, forest carbon stocks over a period or the emissions. But this has to be measured against the reference level. And these are kind of the two elements of defining the commodity. You need someone to sell it or providers in a PES system, which is about carbon rights. It's about benefit sharing. I'm coming back to this in, in half a minute. You need a set of buyers, basically three sources, compliance market, voluntary market, or public funds, for example, development aid. And finally, you need some rules of the game, some institutions, a marketplace and standards. So these, for any type of market or market-like mechanism, this is what you need, the four key elements of, of any type of market. And when we talk about red credit credibility, it's linked to getting all these four elements of a market in place and having credibility on all this, whether it's benefit sharing, how you have defined emission reduction, et cetera. So for the buyers, you have essentially three sources. Originally, when we talked about RED in Bali in 2007, in Copenhagen two years later, when we didn't get the Copenhagen protocol or Copenhagen agreement, the original idea was a cap and trade model after the Kyoto Protocol, where countries take on, on commitments and you can meet those commitments as you did under the Kyoto and the Clean Development Mechanism by buying credits in other, in other countries or trading among, say, among Annex 1 countries as you also could in Kyoto. That was the idea. Compliance market where red can be used as an offset. So compliance because there are quotas set, caps being set by some authority, a national government typically, or it could be a state government as California stuff. This is a mixed bank, basically because of the reluctance to take on commitments by, by countries legally binding commitments such that you have to reach a certain, and if you don't, you can buy your credits offsetting. So the second is the voluntary market, and as Sven alluded to, there's been a remarkable growth in this. See, from 2000 to 2001, where this increased by almost fourfold, up to two billion um, billion US dollars here. It was a slight dip in into in last year in 22 for reasons that we all can think of. It's it's mainly the companies, I would say, the big change. The companies are committing to net zero emissions and they realize we cannot do everything on our plant, in our upstream and downstream supply 
chains, we have to we have to get some offsets to do that. It's also very much a project focus because you want to to have something that is more tangible and concrete and show your shareholders the 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 uh, the, uh, the general public that this is our project this is how we have offset it and it need to be concrete concrete rather than saying we bought emission reductions from peru or indonesia and said this is our reductions the third one is the public funding and and this has been up to now 90 percent from oda or official development aid you can see the graph here how the share of climate funding, both adaptation and mitigation, as you can see that the mitigation part has increased quite a bit. And it's now a third of development aid. This is an increasing concern among many poor countries that, that climate has kind of grown too big and taken resources away from, from uh, from more directly poverty reducing. Although, of course, a stable climate is also necessary for fighting poverty in the future. So who are the sellers? And this is a long debate, just touch on some few. Basic question, who owns an emission reduction in the forest? And, and Cecilia Luttrell, was it C4, uh, and a few others, we wrote an article in 10 years ago among the different rationales for the benefit share in Hushdal. It can be those who do the emission reduction taking the actions. It can be some based on cost, it can be on the facilitators, those are the legal rights, the stewardship, those that are protecting the forest, indigenous groups, for example, or it can be a particular pro-poor benefit that you're using the proceeds from, from carbon credits to sell. In practice, a compromise between very different it can consideration effectiveness efficiency in particular on one side and equity on the other side. Third element is to define this emission reduction. And in kind of theory, it's very simple. You have an emission reduction, it's the, using this, this IPCC framework, you have a, an activity, which is the reduction in the area uh, of being deforested, that's the activity, and you multiply it by an emission factors, carbon per hectare. Uh, and it's critical because you define the impact. Did it work? You define success, the reputation. Will you be re-elected because of you have delivered in the environmental area? Or most importantly, it defines the payments in a result-based system. So setting reference level is very tricky, as we'll hear about more. It's something hypothetical because you have to define the counterfactual what would happen without the policy and we'll never see it and you can never prove that this is wrong because we are defining a scenario that did not happen namely the development in emissions without red, red intervention it's strong economic and political interest related to that and it's also some conceptual confusion i've been through that when i got involved in some reports in just after Copenhagen, we had uh, the main interpretation of, of reference level was a business as usual scenario, kind of more technical prediction. And that's what you use in impact assessment. Now, increasingly in at least the UN FCCC documents, it has come to, to refer to something as a, you may call a crediting baseline, something that is like, that is like an emission quota and, and that's two very different things to what should be the quota, from which point would you like to get paid, and a prediction of what will happen in the absence, the normal use of the reference level. And now in the submissions to the UNFCC, it's mainly using in terms of a, of a crediting baseline. So uh, my favorite quote about the reference level is this a reference level is a benchmark set so low that success is guaranteed and um, in, in an early of the red books we published we kind of made this distinction and some clarification because in 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 cop 15 in copenhagen when they had some decisions on how to develop forest reference emission levels or forest reference levels you take into account historical data and adjust for national circumstances. National circumstances, some 
so some negotiator described of, to me, not as a black box, but a can of worms that you want to open it, but it's so hard that you close it. So it's up to the countries to kind of define what's national circumstances. So that's for the baseline, but then there may be other national circumstances relevant for the a more crediting baseline from at which point you should be paid for emission reductions, depending on say capabilities or climate depth, and maybe some other same certainty that you would like to take into account when setting that baseline. But at least this make a distinction between the two. And then finally, is the institution, the rules. You need some independent verification certification. And I often compare it to coffee. And carbon is not coffee. We cannot have emission reductions for breakfast. So the, the kind of trivial point is that the when a buyer gets an emission reduction, it's used as offset. It's a paper that you would like to use in your accounting you don't have it for breakfast you don't have a profit from it you just want to have it a proof that somewhere else emissions have been reduced and you can use it for in your accounts whereas coffee when i buy coffee i would like good arabica that tastes well that is a good dark roast which i prefer and i have a very strong interest in the quality of that the same kind of quality Control the, at least the incentives for that does not exist. Of course, there is a reputational risk. And if you look at the at least the NF, uh, the UNFCCC process, it says in the Warsaw uh, framework on red to offer a facility, non-intrusive technical exchange of information, which is like leaving to the countries to suggest from what point would you like to get paid with the obvious kind of incentive problems it creates. In the volunteer market, you have taken a similar approach, but um, of historical plus some adjustments. And we'll hear more about exactly how exactly that can be done. Again, I should stress that there's no kind of correct formula to be done, and you can never really, or you can somewhat test it, but never fully test it whether you got the accurate uh, reference level. So finally, the contribution of science. I think one will hear in particular, Aaron will talk about how we can learn from lessons in other fields, because setting reference level is actually key in science. We, we normally present it under other names like impact assessment, but the impact assessment is to, to define a counterfactual and then look at the present situation compared to that counterfactual, establishing causality. So it's very much a core and I think one those involved in this can also learn a lot just from general scientific principles. And the second is this, on a good day, I like to think that, that uh, research and academics are more independent than, than uh, others. So we have this. And I'd like to finish with this uh, quote, uh, a few years old, 1892, from a statistician. Uh, whenever the struggle resurfaces between the champions of the general interest and that of private interest, you will find us, the statistician, at our post armed and ready to march. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Arilt. <clears throat> Kevin, you are uh, you are next, and. Uh, uh, you have been working much more with the uh, applied side also of all of this. Uh, I look forward to your presentation. Great, thank you, Sven. Um, so I'm Kevin Brown, um, here representing the Wildlife Conservation Society. And um, thank you to C4 eCraft for um, sponsoring me on this trip. Um, I, I speak um, on behalf of Wildlife Conservation Society uh, wearing a few different hats. Um, on the one side, um, we're an NGO, but we do act as a Red Plus project developer in the voluntary carbon market. Um, excuse me one second. Can I, uh, Sven, may I please have the, the slide answer? Thank you. Sorry. No worries. Um, sorry, one moment. Let me see if I can advance the slides here. Oh. 
Okay, I got it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so um, we, we, we um, we're involved in developing um, uh, avoided deforestation and uh, reforestation projects around the world. We have 15 years of experience in this. We led the development of two of the most highly regarded avoided deforestation projects, the Makira project in Madagascar and the Kiosema project in Cambodia, you may have heard of. Um, we're field led with staff in over 50 countries. Um, and we have um, staff, um, including myself, who have um, authored um, existing and forthcoming uh, methodologies in the voluntary carbon market. Um, so I speak from kind of the project developer side, from the, the standards development side, and then I come from a remote sensing GIS background, and I've, I've done enough capacity building assistance to uh, governments on uh, developing their uh, NFMS, their National Forest Monitoring Systems, to um, kind of understand what are some of the practical trade-offs of um, how do you ensure that monitoring is done um, and, and baselines are set in such a way that um, you're, 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 you're accurately um, accounting for the carbon and emission reductions, but not placing an undue burden on the process. So um, a quick note, why does WCS still support the Red Plus mechanism? Um, it's really the only game out there that provides long-term sustainable financing for natural forests. Um, people have talked about other things, they've piloted other things at smaller scales, but it's the only mechanism that's been tried and that has a large potential proven pool of financing behind it. So for the, for the near term, it's, it's, the, it's the really the only game in town for us. Um, and it makes the carbon owners participants in the market. Okay? They're not recipients of aid. Um, you're actually engaging them in producing a, 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 a global product and um, you're empowering them to take ownership of their resource. So that's really important to us. Um, at the outset of this session, Sven um, mentioned something on the top of everyone's mind. Um, we've been hearing a lot about integrity in Red Plus. We want to ensure that um, projects are producing credits that have integrity. Um, we've heard integrity come under question from, from different angles. And I, I just want to pick that apart a little bit. Um, and you know, what do people really mean when they're talking about that? Um, and, I, and I can at least speak to what, how we think of integrity at, at WCS. Um, so much of the discussion that we've heard of the criticisms has been around the atmospheric integrity. So, um, and particularly additionality, but we also have to think about um, leakage and we have to think about uh, uh, permanence. Um, but this is kind of around the atmospheric integrity. Is, is a carbon offset, um, um, is a carbon offset credit actually doing harm to the atmosphere? Um, but there's other parts of integrity we have to think about. And um, of course, um, you know, Biodiversity, are we leaving the planet in a, in a better shape for the next generation than, than we found it? Um, and equity, um, how do we ensure that the maximal amount of the benefits of the, this financial mechanism are going back into the people that, that, that um, actually live and depend on these resources, that it's not just a, a, some kind of profit mechanism for, for outsiders? Um, so I, I, I like to think about, um, you know, that so, there was a comment earlier today in the plenary about the, the perfect not being the enemy of the good. And that's my mindset here with integrity and Red Plus. Um, you know, we hear a lot about uh, atmospheric integrity. Um, you know, we, we'll, you, you, you hear a lot about um, the, having equitable outcomes, uh, and these are absolutely critical. But if we have um, Red Plus that has atmospheric integrity and equitable outcomes, but is not a financially viable mechanism because it's too hard to implement, the, 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 the requirements are impossible for anybody to meet, then it's never gonna scale and it's never gonna really reach the, the potential to um, actually serve as a tool to address the climate crisis. So having atmospheric integrity and equitable outcomes without financial viability is a global failure. Just wanna, just wanna put that provocation out there. Um, and I wanna, delve a little bit into um, the, you know, putting on my, um, you know, project developer hat and talking to the private sector actors that really want to get involved in this space. Um, they, they really want to get in and develop projects and um, make use of those offsets, but some of the challenges that they face. Um, I, I, was, I was interested to hear um, um, Alred say um, earlier today that, uh, earlier in the session, 
that um, ODA funding is actually increasing for climate mitigation. Um, that's that, that that's um, I'd love to follow up on that. But I I think what we found in our space that even if maybe it is increasing, it's still far insufficient to meet the demand needed for the financial the, the, the amount of money that's required to set up a red project is um, easily millions of dollars and oftentimes these investments don't produce any emission reductions um, that that result in like a, a a net profit you don't you can't repay that investment for sometimes five ten or more years so the private sector is looking at this like an investment they're sinking a lot of they would need to sink a lot of money into one of these projects there needs to be some kind of um, assurances from their side that if they perform to a certain standard that's known ahead of time, that's outlined in a carbon uh, offsetting methodology, that if they perform to those standards, that those credits will be issued and that they can sell them. And there's so much uncertainty in this space that they already have to cope with. Um, and when I say investors, I really mean what I mean is um, anyone who has an economic stake in the project. So it's not just those that, that, that that put in the, the, the financial capital, but it's the carbon owners too, who are paying in the opportunity cost of not using that forest for something else, okay? Because that's, that's often a, a quite substantial cost. You're, you're asking them not to get some other kind of economic benefit from that, um, from, from the use of that forest. So there's so much uncertainty already. Um, you have to ensure that your project actually performs against the baseline, right? Um, you have to deal with the, the volatility in the in, in carbon in the price of carbon credits you have to deal with changing regulatory environment around carbon offsetting all of these things can be mitigated to a certain degree um, but the one that's that's new that's been a real challenge is with the um these discussions about high integrity and these um, um these ex post assessments of additionality are the risk that after you've gone through all of the investment and all of the work and, and issued these credits after after how many years that you then find out that well actually the global scientific community actually doesn't think that that carbon credit is a real thing so you didn't actually produce anything so that strikes fear into the heart of the whole community and it really um it, it, it really has put a, um, a a chilling effect on some of these um actors who might be um otherwise um wanting to get more involved Okay. So um, this this is um, you know this event you know we're mostly come from a, a you know forest monitoring background and thinking about you know modeling you know forest change. So I want to kind of tie together why are we talking about financial viability of projects to um, to the evolutions in the voluntary carbon market standards because the decisions that we make and how these standards are set up have implications for financial viability and for atmospheric integrity. So it's, it's a really important balance to get right. Uh, I wanna frame for a quick second, how the voluntary um, carbon, uh, speaking here just about the avoided deforestation methodologies um, were typically set up or um, over the past 10 years, it uses a reference region approach. You identify a proxy for your project somewhere else in the country, you develop a historical deforestation rate from that, and then you apply that to your project area and assume that that's your, your future rate of loss. Um, and then of course that's validated um, against uh, using a, a, a third party um, audit. And for a quick second, why was this approach set up this way? Well, there were practical reasons. It wasn't because you know Vera or anyone wanted to allow project developers to game anything. There were practical reasons. Um, there was no, um, Google Earth Engine, you know, 15 years ago, there was no University of Maryland deforestation data set. People were still um, uh, classifying a single Landsat image at a time. So the idea that a project developer could go and assess an entire baseline drawing on uh, information from an entire jurisdiction, it was just unrealistic. So hence why the reference region approach was, was developed. Um, moving to what I'm calling Red 2.0, which is um, not an official term or anything, uh, is that um, in the, the way that Vera has been moving in a, a, a new avoided deforestation methodology that's um, gone out for public comment a few times, it's going under final validation as we speak, is that now um, all projects are going to get a baseline that their activity data, their deforestation rate, 
allocated from a, a jurisdictional pool so that no projects can be over allocated such that it adds up to more than the 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 the, the reference than the, than the reference level for the country uh, there's no more use of trends only historical averages that will reduce volatility in the baselines um, and then the the baseline projection period has been shortened to six years so it allows more um, frequent um, updating of of of, to, to, of the baseline to follow trends uh, changes in forest trends Um, and um, some of the big advantages to this methodology are one, it dramatically reduces the amount of um, resources that have to be spent on analysis for projects to get up and running. It allows project developers and countries to understand where are the high potential places in their country to invest in. It's just known ahead of time. They don't have to go through a bunch of feasibility studies. Um, and most importantly, um, by developing these data sets at a jurisdiction, it allows um, the voluntary carbon market to leverage existing capacities in government, MRV, and, F and FMS offices, um, bring them into the process and start to bring um, revenue into those offices and get them, get them prepared for um, you know, jurisdictional red, which is the next phase. Um, I know I'm getting over time, so I just want to touch on two really important areas I think that haven't, that are we're still grappling at how to address in the best way possible. Um, um, a, a, a huge issue is, is the risk map. Um, the way that this methodology works is that baseline is allocated to projects using a jurisdictional risk map. Um, there has been a lot of work that's gone into um, creating some metrics for how to identify which is the best risk map of all the different options. Um, total operating characteristic and area under curve but it's really an area that I think needs more um, discussion and bringing in more, more experts. So I would definitely advise um, you know, those with a background in that to, to contribute. Um, and then uh, secondly, um, I won't go through all of these points, but there, uh, leakage is, is a big area of uncertainty. Um, there are several different types of leakage risk that are accounted for under the um, VERA methodologies. And all of them, to some degree or another, um, are based on an understanding of uh, human behavior. And um, I, I can say that these, um, how leakage is assessed and how it's monitored has not received nearly as much attention from the MRV community as has some of the forest carbon sides. So it's an area of, I think, um, that has huge implications for additionality, but hasn't received as much attention. Okay, well, I think I'm over time, so we'll just end there. Thank yep. you very much. Thank you. Good, Kevin. So we are shifting back online now to, uh, to Aaron Sills uh, from North Carolina State University. Um, Aaron, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. And now let's see if you'll be able to. Sh um, See my screen? We can see the file, just need it in presentation mode, if possible. I have it in presentation mode now, is that what you see? Yes, now, yep. Excellent. Perfect, okay. Uh, well, good afternoon in Rome to everyone. I'm going to continue on the theme of the first two speakers, um, that is comparing the methods that we use for MRV or for accounting for carbon credits to the methods that we use for evaluating the impact of red plus interventions. Um, and so just to run through this comparison, again, I think we're all reinforcing the same point here. For both of these, um, you need the MRV piece. So you need to identify where the intervention is being implemented, the red plus area, um, and you need to monitor forest change in that area so that you can estimate um, the emissions associated with any deforestation or forest degradation. That gives us a measure of what happens with RED. So the difference comes in um, when we start comparing that measure to something else. Um, in the first case, we're going to compare it to um, an ex-ante forecast of what forest change was expected under business as usual. 
um, you know, that is what sets up what Arl called the crediting baseline. In contrast, for impact evaluation, we're going to compare the same measure to ex post observations, um, contemporaneous observations of forest change in comparable areas that are also under business as usual, right? So there's no red projects there, and that gives us our counterfactual. So two different types of comparisons for really two fundamentally different um, purposes. So the first um, ex ante forecast establishes essentially a, a performance benchmark. Um, so Arl suggested maybe a low performance benchmark, but nevertheless, it's a benchmark. And carbon credits are generated when either forest loss or emissions fall below that benchmark, or what's typically called a, a reference level. Um, switching to impact evaluation, <clears throat> we're going to um, take ex post observations that establish what would have happened in the context of other ongoing policy and economic changes. Right. So this is what the world would have looked like given all the other changes going on, but without a red project. That provides an estimate of the impact of different types of red interventions, you know, whether and how much impact they have on reducing forest loss, under what conditions, um, and serves as really important feedback to both investors, potential investors in red, and to policymakers. <clears throat> um, okay, so this sets up a challenge. Moving on to the the second part, so those are that's the comparison. The challenge is that. Conceptually, this ex ante forecast and ex post observation that we have in the two um, different approaches are trying to get at the same thing. They're trying to get at a prediction of what would have happened without red. But in practice, they're really not interchangeable, right? So, this ex ante forecast can't substitute into causal impact evaluation because fundamentally, the forecaster is never going to know. Um, all of the other changing political and economic and social conditions that affect outcomes under the counterfactual, right? So that doesn't work. Um, likewise, the, the ex post observation, so observations of forest change, forest loss and comparison areas, isn't a good substitute for our accounting or especially our contracting system. Um, because when you set up the essentially the contracts to tell someone you will pay them if they deliver reduced forest loss and reduced emissions, you don't you don't know this ex post outcome, right? And further, the people who are involved in the contracting don't have control over it. They don't have property rights over the control areas or the comparison areas. Um, so again, that doesn't make sense as part of a payment upon results type um, contract. Okay, so we've got two different systems, one to generate carbon credits and the other to generate feedback. So I'll come back to in the end, we do want to, to use that feedback to improve our system for carbon credits, um, but that's different than confounding the two, right? So the two are not exactly the same. Um, and just to continue to hammer this home, we can look at this graphically, which is what I'll do next. If we take sort of the simplest version of um, the accounting approach or the MRV approach, which is to say, let's look at what forest change was going on? What was the deforestation rate before a red project came in in the intervention area? Um, and then we're gonna compare that to what happens after our intervention, right? And if deforestation, deforestation rate or rate of forest degradation goes down, then you get credit for that, right? Um, and so reference levels are actually more complex than this, but you could think of this as really the most simplest approach. Um, to in order to do an impact evaluation of whether our red project actually had an impact and a causal effect on the rate of deforestation, we need to bring in comparison areas. <clears throat> and then we're gonna compare the rate of change in deforestation or degradation in the intervention area and the comparison area. And that difference is going to give us our estimate of the causal impact of the red intervention in what's called the Bakke approach. So before, after, control intervention. <clears throat> um, so to illustrate this, I'm going to draw on C4's global comparative study on red, which was set up using the Bakke approach. Um, so we looked at these 23 different sites where red projects were being implemented across the global south. And in most of these sites, we selected villages both inside the red area and outside the red area 
selected so that they had similar underlying drivers of forest change. That is, they were pre-matched. Um, and then we collected really loads of data from before the RED project started in roughly 2010, and then after the RED project started. So we first went back in 2013. Uh, for today, though, I'm just gonna focus on remote sensing information about forest cover in these areas. Um, so we did use the Hansen Global Forest Change data. Um, and what I'm showing you here is taking the before after approach, we looked at all of 23 initiatives and we calculated for each of them, what was the average annual deforestation before the project and the average annual deforestation after the project. And if the average annual deforestation went up, then we say that's a poor outcome in this before after comparison. If it went down more than 0.1 is the range we're using here, we say it was a good outcome. And then if it was about zero, um, neutral. So that's that simple sort of before after approach. You set a reference level based on what was happening before and then you look at what happens. So not great outcomes. Nine projects had increasing deforestation. But of course, you should immediately be thinking maybe that's because the background level of deforestation was increasing. And so you actually want to compare these project sites um, to, to the rest of the landscape. And that's what we do here. So we compare the deforestation in the project sites to deforestation in the jurisdiction that um, includes the four, those red sites. And we find that fewer of them increase deforestation relative to the background increase in deforestation in that jurisdiction. And then next, we move down to look at the specific villages we selected. Again, we selected villages inside and outside most of these sites um, to find comparable villages. And what's most notable here is when we compare villages that were matched, that have similar, similar underlying drivers of deforestation, we do find that a much smaller fraction of these sites look like they have poor performance, and a much larger fraction look like they have good performance. Um, so the conclusion is that careful selection of control areas in this case is actually revealing that these red projects had an impact. They reduced deforestation relative to what happened um, in the matched villages. Um, and just one more illustration here, and then I will wrap up. Um, so that suggests that the um, controls are really critical um, to select carefully. So again, what I did in that example, or what we did in that example was we picked matching villages. But another approach um, that was referenced in the Guardian coverage that Sven talked about is to look for a weighted combination of potential controls um, that are both matched in terms of the underlying drivers of forest change and that are following a similar trajectory of forest change historically. Okay, so that's an alternative way to find a control set or a comparison set. We applied that to um, 12 red projects in the Brazilian Amazon. This is work led by Thales West and published in PNAS in 2017. So in this case, in these 12 projects, what we did is in red here, this shows the cumulative deforestation in hectares from 2000 to 2018. Um, so it shows cumulative deforestation going up, as you might expect in most of these 12 projects. And then in blue, what we're doing, let's look at the top left here, before the project's implemented, we're looking for um, a combination, a synthetic combination of other sites in the Brazilian Amazon that follow the same path of deforestation. And then we look at what actually happens to deforestation in that synthetic control after the project was implemented. And in this top left case, we see that in red, the synthetic, um, or in blue, sorry, the synthetic control had higher deforestation than the red project in red. So this is what you would hope if you were running a red project is that your deforestation is lower than the deforestation in the control. With this method, we can actually test for statistical significance. And what we find in this study is that in only one of these sites is there a statistically significant impact deforestation. So only one site manages to reduce deforestation in a statistically significant way. All of these projects, however, are claiming credits for reducing deforestation and reducing forest carbon emissions. So again, I want to come back to the main point here. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because um, for evaluating the impact, we're looking at what happened in comparison areas after the projects were implemented. We're tracking those outcomes over time. Whereas what the projects are doing when they set up is they're looking at the information they have in hand at that point, 
um, that's forest change in their project site and in comparison areas, and they're using that to build a forecast. Okay, so I think what we what we need to remember to do is um, sort of to use the information from the impact evaluation to help improve the system for forecasting the counterfactual. So back to the theme of not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, we don't need to um, expect, or we shouldn't expect that these are going to be identical because they're based on fundamentally different information. But we should fully expect that we're gonna use the information from impact evaluation to design better accounting systems that maximize the incentives to maximize reductions in deforestation. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Great, so we're turning back to, uh, to plenary and uh, uh, I have, can give you now a presentation, uh, a short presentation on a, a uh, meta study of, uh, of uh, how Red Plus projects have in fact, uh, what impacts they have, they have created. Um, and we start out from a theory of change of what Red Plus uh, is trying to achieve, you know, with some, some funding flows from bilaterals and privates, uh, et cetera, uh, and some information of a, uh, uh, about uh, forest stocks and their development in the past. You know, we, we typically have a mix of, me of measures, you know, some incentives, some disincentives, and some enabling measures that are treatments. And then we want to see some some outputs. We want to see that that people actually actually understand that intervention, that they participate to a certain extent on the ground, uh, and this then should have you know some uh, uh, reach some outcomes uh, uh, in terms of reduced deforestation uh, uh, on the ground, uh, and perhaps also some improved uh, incomes. Uh, and in terms of impact, obviously our end goal is uh, to uh, uh, to reach uh, sort of mitigated uh, global greenhouse gas emissions and some side objectives uh, uh, regarding biodiversity and human well-being, etc. Uh, but often our impact evaluations will actually be at the at the outcome stage uh, in terms of measuring uh, land use impacts. So in this meta study, uh, we have to somehow delimit. What we what we want to take on board in terms of the actions uh, that are taken that is number one to four here, uh, and in terms of the publications and, and uh, that we uh, that we uh, want to to uh, to include, uh, and in terms of the actions, for instance, I'm not going to go through every detail here, but we excluded pure uh, afforestation reforestation projects. Um, uh, we did include as a separate category. Uh, national pest schemes that had a carbon that also had a carbon uh, focus. And in terms of literature, uh, uh, you know, we are uh, we are including a uh, uh, we are including both uh, gray and peer-reviewed peer uh, literature. Um, uh, uh, but we want to focus on a, on the end part of the theory of change that I've just shown you on on uh, outcomes and on, and on impacts. Uh, and we want to in we're taking a rigorous approach in terms of uh, counterfactual approaches uh, that are being used in quasi experimental methods. Okay, so what do we get in terms of uh, global coverage? This shows like the density of red projects, so it's the, uh, the areas enrolled uh, in red plus projects over the forest area. Uh, 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 which is interesting in the sense that uh, uh, you actually have uh, quite a lot of red projects, uh, relatively speaking, in, for instance, in part of East Africa and, and in the Andean countries compared to Brazil, which has absolutely many red projects, but, but actually not so much in compared to the huge forest areas that the, that the country holds. Uh, and our sample is quite well, that's the red uh, part, uh, red colored part, uh, which is fairly well distributed across uh, uh, across the uh, the tropics, um, uh, with some areas, the Congo Congo Basin, for instance, is not well represented. Also, some South Asian uh, red projects, etc. So, 
So what are our results? Uh, uh, we split that up into the uh, sort of the red projects and programs, and then these public PES programs that have also a carbon focus. And you can see for both of them, uh, we find uh, significant impacts, uh, uh, but they're, they're quite small and they're quite variable uh, uh, across, across different projects. Um, uh, but there is some, at least some uh, uh, causal effects uh, to, uh, to, uh, to call for. Um, what about the permanence part? That's a particular interest for forest carbon, as you know. Um, and in principle, uh, you could imagine, if you look at the diagram uh, in the lower part here, you could imagine that uh, after a project has stopped, uh, which is the second uh, vertical line, uh, you could either, and it has managed in the red part to reduce uh, deforestation, it could either continue on that reduced part, like S1, that would be great. It could continue on the old path, uh, that is S2, it could also continue towards the old part, but in the pick up, uh, really eat up that forest conservation gain that you would have reached during the project. Uh, or you could, at the extreme, have a really accelerated, uh, uh, worse than before kind of scenario of, uh, of accelerated deforestation. Um, there are few uh, of, of those uh, assessments after project available, but what we can see is that uh, it's kind of the, the S2 part is, is, uh, is the one that is, seems to be dominating. You get a parallel trend, but you have, you keep kind of the, per, the transitory gains you have made uh, during project implementation, uh, you, you are able to keep those. Uh, we also assess the welfare part, and what we find is, uh, you know, uh, even smaller uh, positive outcomes in terms of impact sizes. Um, uh, typically, people don't get worse off in the terms of incomes and assets and consumption. Uh, that's the outcome stage. But at the impact stage, which would be the self-perception of how people, uh, their subjective well-being, uh, uh, there you sometimes do get some negative results. And I think it's both a result of, in some cases, equity outcomes. You may not be worse off, but you feel worse off because some other people got better off in your village, for instance. And also some expectations created around the implementation of these projects that are not always satisfied, uh, for instance, when projects are not being able to be continued. So we also looked for uh, at you know what makes the difference in terms of within sample variation in terms of uh, 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 what 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 factors uh, uh, seem to be boosting uh, effect sizes, um, and clearly uh, uh, if there is a, a real deforestation threat threat to start with in the place where the project is is being uh, is being undertaken uh, that helps in terms of that's quite intuitive that uh, if you really fight against something then uh, you're also more likely to to get a uh, to get a result uh, uh, so that's important uh, spatial targeting towards high forest carbon density high threat within your within your site uh, for instance road near areas etc those that did spatial targeting also achieved better results and on the welfare side perhaps a bit surprisingly uh, when there are the benefits are being differentiated uh, that uh, which is often used to squeeze rents etc uh, then then uh, is sort of the, uh, the the welfare effect is larger, and that's maybe because you're able to customize then to different people's uh, needs uh, uh, those benefits uh, generated. So, how well does Red Plus do compared to other kind of conservation tools that are out there? Um, uh, it seems to be that uh, this is the kind of the uh, just the Cohen's D uh, effect. You know, the higher it is, the more the more impact uh, you would have, and uh, you can see compared to other enabling measures or uh, disincentives uh, like command and control or uh, other incentives. 
Um, there are no, not significant differences, really. There's a lot of variation within these categories, uh, but at least it does uh, uh, as, as well, uh, at least as well or as poorly as, as other conservation tools. Still, it is the case that we, uh, that many of the conservation things we do do not really su uh, it's sufficiently large scale change behavior on the ground. We still have things to, to learn about, about this. Um, of course, this does not analyze cost effectiveness. Some of these projects are expensive in terms of having like a boutique like uh, character that, that uh, shows off uh, in various ways. So uh, uh, this, this is not integrated in, in, in the assessment. And then I wanted to just briefly come back to, to also the discussion that all the previous pre speakers have taken up uh, about the additionality, about baselines and about, a, uh, about the impact evaluation. So these are <coughs> similar figures, uh, illustrations as those show, shown by Aaron, but for uh, uh, Thales West's newest uh, research, where the approach of uh, synthetic controls is being extended to, to a global sample. And this has also been used as background material for the, uh, for the Guardian article in, in January. Um, and in, uh, obviously, I don't want to go into, into details, but you have, here, you have here both the de facto observed deforestation in red. Uh, you have some deforestation synthetic con control sites uh, uh, that uh, in blue, and you have the ex ante deforestation baselines that the projects have been using. And I think what you can see even at a quick glance is that uh, uh, you see a project starts with the vertical lines, and you can see a lot of these projects uh, have a, uh, a yellow lines that compared to to the uh, uh, past deforestation move up like hockey sticks, right? Uh, so they assume that after the project starts that you would get a really large pickup in deforestation. And that's, that's problematic, of course, when you get that uh, at such a disseminated uh, sc uh, scale of, of, a, uh, of different, different projects. So my point here is that uh, um, uh, you know those uh, sort of critical results we have received, like in 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 this study, that more than ninety percent of the carbon credits were non-performing. Um, uh, they are only in part due to the to the relatively modest impacts on on forests on the ground that these projects have had. They are obviously to to a larger scale due to to some of the assumptions that initially have been made uh, about. Uh, uh, about the baselines uh, adopted by the projects. So, five quick uh, takeaway messages. First, a couple of, of contextual ones. Um, I think if we look at the performance of Red Plus, uh, a lot of these uh, things have remained uh, underfinanced. They did not have a sufficient security about uh, future uh, uh, future uh, resources being available, uh, uh, and a lot of the projects uh, have really been a drop in the sea compared to uh, the overall uh, target of, of uh, mitigation. Um, and the things that they have done on the ground is it's uh, uh, it's it's really a mixed bag. It's in a way, uh, Red Plus has been to carbon what what integrated conservation development projects have been to biodiversity. You know, a, a sort of uh, an umbrella for a quite heterogeneous mix of on the ground interventions. As to the impacts that we do find in the study, you know they are typically statistically significant, they are modestly in size, uh, a, they are only permanent in the sense of the transitory gains uh, made that I mentioned. Um, um, and in terms of the, the record is uh, just as good or bad as so many other uh, conservation tools. Um, we believe that Red Plus could have more of, an, of, of a forest uh, conservation impact if these interventions were more spatially targeted in the sense of 
uh, choosing to start with areas where the deforestation is high rather than low, right? Uh, and also then within your site, giving priority to those areas that are really the most threatened to deforestation, make sure that those are enrolled. So this may sound intuitive. I see people nodding in the, in the audience, but it's not exactly what characterizes those projects that we are, uh, that we are looking at, uh, not for all of them at least. Uh, and I think for for the integrity of uh, of uh, carbon credits, um, uh, I also think we really need to look into to uh, how the baselines are being constructed in the first place. And and Kevin mentioned now there's a reform process going on where we're trying to uh, to sort of also learn from these impact evaluations that uh, science has brought forward, uh, and perhaps find some some methods that are that are better equipped. Uh, thank you very much. So we now turn to the discussion part. We have a short intervention from Tui uh, as, as a commentator. Please, Tui. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, oh, the presenter, for a very um, impressive presentation. I think that I just wanted to pick up one of the thing, which is uh, both Arrow and also Kevin mentioned in the presentation, which is looking at the social integrity aspect and the fact that uh, we need to have an equitable sharing of benefits as well as the involvement of local communities to ensure the equities and the fairness are taken into account. I think that's based on that few things um, that are the results from our 14 years of research under C4 Global Comparative Study on Red Plus, looking at both national policies on price carbon market as well as looking at the project level. I think that why we see a lot of improvement and a lot of discussion on how to advance the methodology to evaluating the carbon credit. I think that the progress in terms of non-carbon benefit um, has been much lower compared to the other aspect. We have seen in many countries some of the key enabling conditions that Ari put into his presentation, such as institutional framework to clarify who's on the carbon rise and who should be the beneficiary to receive the payment is still pending. And many countries after 15 years of implementing Red Plus are still in the process of designing beneficiary mechanism and the countries have a lot of difficulties in it. Um, the other thing is when we talk about the cost and benefit in terms of fairness, I think that like we have um, heard from Kevin um, in terms of a lot of improvement and advancement in terms of methodology to reduce the cost to analyze the data and collect the data. With our global comparative study on REP Plus in 2009 until now, where we're documenting the administrative costs uh, from the government, both national and subnational government, most of the time, the subnational government as well as indigenous local community have subsidized many costs of forest carbon project. But these costs are not taken into account, not recorded, and causing quite a challenges in terms of discussion, um, in terms of contract arrangement between government agency or um, with the indigenous people and the private sector. So this cost has to be accounted and taken into account. The other thing is, uh, Sven mentioned earlier in his slides about some of the project are very expensive, but in many cases, the cost to do a proper free prior informing consent involving with the local communities require a significant um, financial resources. And unfortunately, if you're looking at many national uh, Red Plus policies and the forest carbon project based on our global database, the cost given to gender uh, mainstreaming or to implementing social safeguard receive a very modest amount compared to other things, which uh, brought our attention, if you wanted to commit it to social safeguard and also equitable outcome, you also need to provide sufficient financial resources to it. The other thing that we wanted to also highlight in our research is perhaps with the forest carbon market, we always think that it could be one of the policy instruments leading to transformational change. But in fact, we also need to have transformational change in many things to enable forest carbon uh, market particularly with the land tenure system, with a social safeguard, which has been, I think, that underdeveloped compared to the other advancement uh, when other presenters talk about the methodology. Yeah, so just a quick comment from the equity perspective. 
Thanks, Ben. Sorry. Thank you, Tui. Uh, excellent. Um, so please uh, think about any questions here in, uh, in the public uh, uh, or put them into the Q&A box. Uh, um, while I'm giving the word briefly to, um, as you, briefly to Adelt for also an equally brief uh, comment. Adelt, are you there? I am. Yes, uh, okay, thanks. Uh, very, very nice uh, all four with three interventions. And just a couple of points I, I would like to. I think, Kevin, you mentioned this that you have a situation where a uh, project developer has a perfectly good project, has delivered, and then comes uh, Sven and colleagues and publish an article telling, well, maybe there were no emission reductions after all, and used inflated baselines and uh, so first I have to say that this is not a new. I remember the first Noel Camp project in Bolivia where Greenpeace 2009, I think it was, came out and very strongly criticized uh, TNC for having exaggerated the impact, which was, I guess, the first kind of forest uh, offsetting project for, for American uh, utilities. So, so it has been a debate. But, but I do see the problem and there, there are a lot of risks and one is to find, uh, yeah, you see that it doesn't hold. I think the, the, the thing that Erin, when you compared the ex post uh, kind of that you normally do an impact assessment versus the ex ante before the project, that, uh, that that's something we can learn. And it was also in 2009, I had to check the article while someone was speaking, that uh, Combs Motel and other, which had this successful, and then compensated successful efforts. So the risk, you set a reference level, but you may say have a formula where you adjust it when you see what happened. One example is this, what happened these days, it's a much higher commodity prices that, that may put a pressure on forests. So if you had, say, the reference level, the business as usual scenario depends on how commodity prices, that would actually reduce the risk of an investor. Because if you have a corona situation with high commodity prices, putting a pressure on deforestation, you're, you're, you're more like, you're, sorry, you are less likely to achieve a certain emission reduction based on a predetermined or an ex ante reference level. But if you could just and say that okay there were increased pressure on forests so therefore we we adjust upwards the reference level so you compensate for the effort rather than the actual reductions when we have the information afterwards so this should actually be a risk reducing thing and and should be welcomed by project uh, proponents i think the problem is don't make it too complex keep it sensible sensibly simple kiss the KISS principle also applies here. But it will be interesting to, to hear from Kevin also whether, you know, I know you're not with Vera anymore, but, but that and private investor, whether they would think of some simple formula for some ex post adjustment of the baseline that actually will reduce the risk for, for a project development. Thank you. Also, great inputs. Uh, I will now turn it to the public because we have been talking a lot ourselves. So we want some, some inputs from the rest of you. And I will take uh, those questions that are now and then uh, the panel can, can react. I have the lady in red over there to start with. Oh, various one, great. And I have Karina also, yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the really impressive presentation. We heard a lot of uh, uh, about the history of RED and uh, the impact of the RED uh, implementation of RED uh, Plus project. But uh, uh, what I feel is that perhaps we feel a little, uh, a little peace on the context because uh, from Bali and Copenhagen, the context has totally changed because we, we, had, we have had uh, the Paris Agreement, but uh, more than this, we have the Nancer Transparency Framework that set clear requirements for all parties so all parties now have their national uh, determined contributions so 
climate target in terms of emission reduction, the most of them. And all parties have, are, um, uh, have to submit uh, at the latest by next year, so we are, the, we are there, uh, have to submit greenhouse gas inventory with categories, so no more red. We have LULUCF categories, so forest land or land converted to forest land and whatever. And then more than this, we have still space for Article 6, so for market-based mechanism and so for project to be run at local level or national level or subnational, whatever. But each crediting activities should be reconducted and reconciled at national level with a, with a tabular format to be submitted by each country parties every two years. And this could be taken into account because it's really nice this kind of reflection because we learn a lot from the red plus implementation but we have to change in my in my in my view we have to change our idea in order to adapt to the new context thank, thank you, you. Karin. yes um thank you so much thanks for the presentations and the discussion and my comment are sort of related to um the lady to to my right here and it's really going back to so we have heard sort of one version around red plus which is very much about establishing separate isolated projects where there is an investor that has a need for a return on that investment and we have heard and learned a lot about the problematic sides of that with actually establishing an effect with the accounting and so on but sort of going back to the original thinking around red the way we perceived it and i'm i'm sorry I, I forgot to say i'm with norway's international climate and forest initiative we have been working on this for 15 years and and our our starting point has always been that you need to approach this at the national level so a national level approach to red plus means having a national reference level it, it is linked to the policy implementation, which is necessary for the transformation that we are really seeking to make happen through, through the um, financial incentives. Of course, um, on the ground, those, the, the actual overall outcome in terms of reduced deforestation will be the result of a lot of different projects, but having them all being part of one national strategy under the same um reference level is is extremely important to avoid the issues around leakage that have been described and that we all know to give the basis for benefit sharing um and so on and within that context red plus is much more an a, an instrument or a mechanism to support forest countries towards low emission development to changing the trajectory of economies more dependent on deforestation than on uh, forest protection and, and sustainable forest management. And I'm, I miss that perspective. And I think, just as was said by, by my, <laughs> my friend over there, um, linking Red Plus to the overall nationally determined contribution as one area where you can have um, international support because there is a system established in place uh, is also um, an effective and an easier way, uh, I should say, of, of implementing Red Plus. Um, I would, uh, last, my last point is, is regarding the issue of reference levels and additionality, and it's just a very simple approach in, in saying that historical emission levels um, are well established in a, as a straightforward approach to how you um, start off with the uh, an ambition level for a climate target. And, and so it's really treating the forest sector the way uh, we treat other sectors. Um, it would be interesting to hear the reflections around this discrepancy between the national level red, which we've been working on and we see now is really picking up with some very impressive results from Indonesia and several other countries compared to what has been tested and where we've got important insights from, but which really enters into a lot of um, more difficult issues. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I don't know who was first, actually. 
maybe uh, since you are closer by and then and then you yes thank you uh muri suarez from the mrv unit of mozambique uh so first i think the the issue with these some of these articles uh criticizing the results of red projects uh, in my opinion, has a lot to do with the distinction between avoided deforestation and reduced deforestation. So I think a lot of these projects that go into an area that doesn't have deforestation and predict deforestation are a lot more prone to these biases than a, a, a project um, uh, that aims to reduce deforestation over, over a large area. And I think scale has a big uh, um, has a big relation to it because uh, you, you you we are I think transitioning to a to a phase where we go from you know lots of small projects to more jurisdictional uh, projects and that's the approach that that we've had in in Mozambique um, <clears throat> and so I think with regard to to the the, the presenter uh, Aaron Sill that talked about the control sites I was wondering. Um, how how she sees this this working when countries are going towards jurisdictional programs where you may have the entire country covered by jurisdictional uh, red programs and you then may may have difficulty finding these control sites because a, a, as it stands now if you have a very small project area then it's easy to find a control site but imagine if every province of a country or uh, uh, you know, large areas are, are covered by red projects. Then, then you may, you may have difficulty uh, finding these these sites. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I have you here, and then I have one online question as well, and then we're going to respond. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. I, I have to say that I ended up a, a little bit confused. I was trying to to find a common denominator, uh, like a wrap up message, to the. Um, to the talks, and I, I have to say that I got mixed messages. No, uh, on the one, on the one hand, I was, I saw a serious ad advocacy towards how uh, projects have been working and how they have or have not delivered, right? Um, but then, for example, from uh, Sven's and Erin's presentation, I see uh, reference to okay. Uh, uh, to compare the performance of projects, we need synthetic uh, compar comparisons. I imagine that it's by statistical matching and these type of things that include a bunch of parameters. Uh, we have used those to assess, for example, the impact of protected areas and, and things like that. But it, it entails that there's a underlying message that the way the reference levels for carbon projects has been established up until now is probably not the right one. OK, so I'm making sure that I understood that correctly so that's 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 a good one the the other thing is that there's a lot of things to connect here uh, uh what was mentioned about jurisdiction i think there was an elephant in the room that there was no mention during the talks about this element of nesting and how carbon projects fit in overarching national or subnational strategies i definitely think that projects should be part of the implementation strategy over broader uh, a, a strategy, uh, basically, of the broader uh, area of intervention. But these also, as Ven was pointing out, need to go and happen in the places where there's actually deforestation happening. Otherwise, these, but this brings another element in, elephant in the room that perhaps touches what Kevin was, was advocating for, which is the fact that we're missing the conservation of carbon stocks in the equation of the perks and recognition, recognition for those. And this is perhaps something that needs to be to be brought up because, and that's why we see a lot of conservation projects being labeled as avoided deforestation projects. And that's why we have these issues with the um, baselines, but also because we need to prepare ourselves for when tackling deforestation is successful, right? Because then we will move into, okay, we stopped it, but now we, mind, we need to maintain this result. And then there, are some, there needs to be some, some element of a maintenance fee or a, an insurance or something that will sustain this in the future. So I didn't see that brought up here. And I think that it's something that I would invite um, you guys to explore, particularly because we, Wildlife Conservation Society is also advocating for this type of, 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 of mechanism and things like that. And I didn't see Kevin mentioning that. Um, uh, here um yeah and then the final one um the other elephant in the room is the fact that we need to pay for implementation that's clear implementation is costly and then of course it's easier to implement where nothing is happening 
it, although it's expensive, it is much more expensive to tackle deforestation where it's actually happening. So that becomes a little bit of a perverse incentive, right? So yeah, some some ideas there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, were there any more questions in the room? Uh, okay, last one. Yeah, more than a question it is a comment. Or I comment. think I think um, um, there have been a very good point here. There has been a change in paradigm since the Paris Agreement because now every single country has commitments, and that was not uh, the case when Red was uh, designed. And to fulfill those commitments, people have countries have to increase their ambition over time every five years. And regarding that, they may look this sector because it's very attractive for themselves. So I think, I mean, it's a change in paradigm. We don't need to think that projects or resource-based payments for red coming from outside of the countries is going to be the main avenue for increasing ambition on the sector. The second comment is, uh, when red was defined, the idea was national, and we had long discussions about that, and it was pointed out behind me as well. And we are only been talking about incentives here, but Red Plus is about policy uh, and incentives. And for example, when you, you deal with your reference areas uh, for the contrafactual, if you have managed to establish a policy enabling and conditions, these may affect also these contrafactual areas, particularly because these policy approaches are national, mostly. So I think we have to reflect on what the discussion was at the beginning of Red Plus, which was incentives are not only monetary incentives and policy approaches are equally important. And the fact that the Paris Agreement also changed the setting of the rules, which doesn't mean that projects may not be useful, but maybe we have to rethink about the objective of projects. I think that's what the lesson learned is. Okay. And, and despite of, of, of the very interesting presentations, I learned a lot today. Um, what it led us to go is towards more complexity. So I, I wonder if this won't deviate the attention to where it needs to be put that with this in changing and transforming uh, the sector. That's, I think, my, Thank you. my reflection. Good. Uh, briefly, an uh, online comment. Yes, question, question from Askari, Indonesia. Indonesia have done restoration on peatland hydrological function through construction of rewetting infrastructure, such as canal blocking, canal backfilling to decrease the peat decomposition, therefore reduce the CO2 emission. The restore area about 3.7 million hectare in concession or company area and about 1 million in community area. Can this achievement be counted or claimed in red and how to get the funding or claim for this achievement? Good. Thank you. We have a large pool of questions and very little time to respond. Um, I will just start out by saying very briefly that the results I represented in the meta study uh, did, I mean, we talked here national versus project level. Uh, so they did actually include uh, some jurisdictional approaches and also some country uh, programs, including the NICFI interventions in Guyana and Indonesia were impact evaluated and in both cases found a, a modest uh, but positively significant impact right uh the thing is that uh not a lot of these uh, uh thing is that that the research will always be like backward looking uh because it takes some time to to analyze the data what really worries me for 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 the future is that i don't see the jurisdictional approaches as they're being rolled out now in practice being accompanied by by uh by efforts to do serious impact evaluation, because often the donors would have to to ask for that that you know these things are being put in place so that they be in five six years uh, can actually uh, get some results of this type for the jurisdictional approaches. That is not happening today. I turn over to the others. Um, great, thanks. So many great comments. I. Um, I think I agree with all of them, but um, I, I just want um, to touch on two things I heard that I think are super important, and I apologize for it not coming out more in my presentation, that um, I completely reject a dichotomy between projects and programs. I think what's happening is that um, you're starting to see them merging together. Um, 
we're always going to need location and site specific interventions right to achieve results at a jurisdictional scale you still need actors who are working in particular places working with particular investors to actually get those results that you can then package in a jurisdiction um, so I think what's so exciting about the new Vera methodology is that it does actually link together now the project accounting with jurisdictional accounting so um, you you, you if you can get that that up and running, um, you can start to generate revenue to finance that the, the, the jurisdictional program and then help to ease that transition to a, a, full, a fully jurisdictional uh, standard in the future. Um, and then secondly, um, yeah, the question about, you know, red was supposed to be jurisdictional. Um, uh, completely agree with that. Um, but red is a mechanism that targets developing countries. And uh, I think it's not totally appreciated. Um, two things, one, how much money it would cost to actually reduce deforestation at a jurisdictional scale, billions of dollars, billions of dollars. And countries don't have those types of resources and the, the private sector, doesn't want to work through national governments usually. It's just a hard truth, but they want to work through site-based interventions um, because they feel like they have more control over the process. Um, so I, I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, Aaron, do you have any any comments on what has been said? I want to give everybody the chance to react. Sure. Um, so first, I agree. All um, great comments and. Um, raising important points. Um, I agree that certainly there is a uh, sort of an institutional drive and probably a need to shift from the project to the jurisdictional approach or to merge, as Kevin said. Um, to my mind, that doesn't um, eliminate any of the challenges we talked about. It just moves them to a different level, right? As Ben said, we still need impact evaluation at the jurisdictional level. We still need to think about how to set reference levels that provide incentives to generate impact. Um, and even more challenging, we need to think about as we transition there, how do we attribute any reductions in deforestation to site-specific projects versus jurisdictions? Um, so I think you can translate everything we talked about to the jurisdictional level. Um, second point I wanted to make is in response to the question clarifying whether we are in fact saying that our impact evaluation um, shows that the way reference levels has been set doesn't accurately demonstrate impact or measure impact. And I would say that is true. Our impact evaluations have shown that reference levels um, were inflated measures of what would have happened in terms of deforestation without red interventions. Um, my point is that it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to substitute uh, or that we can substitute setting uh, crediting baselines with quasi-experimental counterfactuals. Um, what it tells us is that we need to think carefully about how to set the parameters around methodologies for setting those reference levels so that they are set in a way that really incentivizes maximum impact in terms of reducing deforestation. The problem with inflated reference levels is um, that it sets the bar too low, right? And you don't have good incentives to reduce deforestation. Um, so I think I'll leave it at those two points. Thanks. <clears throat> Ariel, do you have one minute to really... Uh come with any uh, gold nuggets? Gold nuggets, okay. Uh, you will decide. I, I think Maria Sanchez, you, you, you said we just added more complexity and, and, and simple answer. Of course, there is a saying that there are no good answer, only good questions. But I think red, like life in general, is a set of dilemmas. Uh, and, and, and we have to deal with that and then try to, facing all dilemmas, try to find reasonable compromise. I mean, we have had some about national, jurisdictional and, and, and project level that red was supposed to be both the national and, but also projects. And that's where the more the appetite for private sector, as Kevin just said, I think it's also this fact that good policies are contaminating the reference levels or baselines that you no, know, it's every six years. And of course the business as usual is or should be now with red policies and you are to reward based on that. Another dilemma is kind of 
red is rewarding those who have high emissions, whereas the forest stewards who have low deforestation, how can they be rewarded in such a system? I think these are dilemmas, and th th there is simply no good answer to that. But I think this one referred to that in a previous session, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and, and that we get it approximately right, we don't need to fine tune it. And I'm increasingly also saying that while we should take a lot of into account on livelihoods on biodiversity, a good rule is that if you have too many objectives and try to kill, sorry for the expression, too many birds with one stone, you 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 are likely to underachieve it. So so I'm kind of from the beginning being an advocate for keeping it relatively simple and try to get something to work. I know that we need to also look at the socioeconomic benefits, but think more in that's the whole package of development interventions that are to ensure that. And for RED, the climate crisis is kind of sufficiently grave and serious to, 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 to deserve a kind of a key focus on that. And keep it as simple as possible, but not simpler. That was Einstein quote. Good. Uh, it is five o'clock uh, and one minute. Um, uh, it's been a very rich session, uh, uh, and I think uh, we, uh, we've all, and that includes myself, have learned a lot uh, about uh, about this topic uh, uh, and about different aspects of its complexity. Um, thank you all for uh, for assisting, and. Uh, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us as presenters for for a further discussion. Thank you. He Hello. <laughs> Just a final announcement, a uh, practical announcement. Okay, we would like to remind everyone that we have uh, an ice cream session and uh, here in the in a tree of life area, so close to the atrium. Um, we also would like to remind participants, so everyone is welcome. Um, we will also would like to remind participants uh, to the tour tomorrow um, that uh, we are going directly after the, um, the exhibition. Uh, so we, please come with comfortable shoes and light bags, not too heavy, because we will go together from here. Thank you very much and enjoy the exhibition and the reception. Thank you.